Prenhandar Paub, and welcome to um, Anti-Racism, How a Medical School Responded to Black Lives Matter and the Hub Cymru Africa Anti-Racist Charter. Um, I'm Beth Kidd, I'm the Senior Development Support Manager at Hub Cymru Africa, and I'm joined by Alison Fiander, who's one of uh, the trustees of the Wales and Africa Health Links Network. Um, just to take you through a bit of housekeeping before we start, um, this event is in a webinar format, which means only the panellists um, can be seen on the screen and their microphones are accessible. Everybody else is muted. Um, although we do encourage you to please uh, join in uh, with the session, you can type in the chat box, which is to the right of this screen. Um, and there's also a section for questions. So the Q&A um, tab, if you click on that, you can put your questions in it and we'll be leaving time at the end of um, Professor Hawthorne's presentation to take questions. Um, you can also make an oral contribution by clicking the raise your hand icon and then we can invite you um, to unmute and put your question verbally. Um, we value your feedback, so we'll be doing a couple of polls at the end of this. Um, if we could get you to fill those in, that would be great. And also to remind anyone that any form of abuse or offensive language uh, or behaviour in the chat box or throughout the session um, will not be tolerated. And to ask you to please be respectful of uh, and mindful of the experiences of others. Um, with that, I will hand over to Alison Fiander. Thanks, Beth, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to this afternoon's session, which promises to be uh, very interesting. Um, I'm um, Alison Fiander, as Beth has said, uh, one of the trustees of the Wales and Africa Health Links Network. Um, we're a network that supports and advocates for partnerships between Wales and Africa that are involved in um, health activities. And if you want to know more about us, please visit the, the website. But now I have great pleasure in um, introducing Professor Camilla Hawthorne. She's a medical educator, um, but has also been um, a GP in South Wales for 24 years or so. Um, she's now head of graduate entry medicine at Swansea University. And um, she's going to talk to us about how Swansea University responded to the Black Lives Matter campaign. So Camilla, we're really looking forward to um, hearing a little bit about your experience in this. So thank you. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I wonder if I could have my first slide up please, Peter. I'm starting by um, asking the question, Next slide, please. Thank you. Is racism prevalent in UK universities? It's a bit of a rhetorical question uh, because the answer is yes. Um, and in fact, the Vice Chancellor of the University of East Anglia has said um, he, he chairs the uh, University's UK Council. He said, it's my firm belief that UK universities perpetuate racism too often BAME, so that's Black and Minority Ethnic students and staff, have been failed, and that needs to change now. And really, um, I think a lot of that change has been happening over the last year, uh, a lot of it in response to Black Lives Matter. Um, and what I'm going to do later on in my presentation is show you how we have responded in the graduate entry medicine course in Swansea. And I think many other medical schools are doing the same. Previously, um, many students worried that if they made a complaint about racism, that could adversely impact on their grades or even their future co careers. Um, and I'm just showing you um, on the left hand side a picture. It's, I think it's actually Manchester University, um, where um, um, which featured in, in the newspapers um, a few months ago uh, with, again, that comment by David Richardson that I just gave you that universities do appear to be institutionally racist. Um, this was um, um, published in April 2021, so only a few months ago, uh, with evidence of systemic issues that affect students from black and ethnic minority groups. Um, that uh, a definition of what we mean by institutional racism, that there are uh, systemic issues that impact disproportionately on particular members of the community, which need to be undone really. Uh, and that students felt failed by universities' responses to allegations of abuse 
Often, even if they made a complaint, they never get to find out what actually then happened or what the investigation found. Um, universities don't acknowledge the effects of that abuse on the students' psychological well-being and academic performance. And they seem to be more interested in their own reputations and how they appear to the public. Next, sample, uh, next slide, please. So here are a few more examples. Um, Cardiff, um, only five years ago, a medical school review or, or play um, had white actors blacked up to portray uh, black people uh, with some sexist, racist and homophobic jokes. Um, and um, there were uh, a number of African students in the audience who made a complaint. Um, and initially it just wasn't handled right. And in fact, the student who made the main complaint was identified by a senior member of staff in, a, in an email to um, other, other people, uh, which led to her being bullied and harassed. And in the end, she left the university and went somewhere else. Um, only last year, a Jewish student woke up one morning to find a swastika spray painted onto his body. He didn't report it. We heard about it later. This wasn't in Cardiff. This was elsewhere in the UK. And the same for Jess, the third example, um, an Indian girl who was nicknamed Onion Bhaji for four years by her peers. And again, she didn't report it. So um, when studies have been done to, or surveys have been done to look at this, we know that large proportions of students uh, don't know how to report racism or how to uh, report this kind of abuse. And we think that the levels of racism are probably higher than are actually reported as a result. Um, again, because um, universities don't keep the complainant informed, the complainant worries that making a complaint will make them be seen as a troublemaker, which might then adversely affect their own progress. Next slide, please. So um, there was a, an Equality and Human Rights Commission inquiry um, by the government in 2019. Um, into this, which found that universities seem to be failing to address really hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of racist incidents every year, that about a quarter of BAME students had experienced some form of racial harassment, and 5% left their courses, and two-thirds didn't report it. That many universities seem to be really unaware of the scale of the problem, um, but seemed overconfident in their ability to respond. But actually, when they did, they responded very poorly. This was then followed by a report by Universities UK called Tackling Racial Harassment in Higher Education. And I've put that on the right-hand side of this slide. So this report a year later, which was only last year, acknowledged institutional racism, it highlighted a lack of diversity amongst senior leaders in the universities. It highlighted that there was a, um, a student attainment gap with white students faring better academically than non-white students. And it also highlighted ethnicity pay gaps amongst university staff. It urged universities to review their policies and procedures and develop new strategies for tackling racial harassment. And it felt that this had to be led from the top. It had to be led by the vice chancellors. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, Universities UK report and the um, URL um, to it, if you wanted to look at it in any detail. But on the right hand side of this slide, I've got um, listed the main recommendations and practical steps that um, uh, that this report suggested all university leaders could actually start doing straight away. First of all, making a public statement, committing to tackling racial harassment, to engage directly with students and staff who had lived experiences of racial harassment, reviewing their current policies and procedures, improving awareness and understanding of racism, racial harassment, white privilege, microaggression, amongst all staff and students, including through anti-racist training. And in fact, some of the racial abuse comes from students against other students. It's not just about staff and students. And to ensure that expected behaviors for online behavior are clearly communicated, as well as breaches and how they be sanctioned. 
uh, developing and introducing reporting systems, and then collecting data on reports of incidents um, so that you know the universities knew what was going on, because very often they don't. Next slide, please. I'm going to move now to uh, differential attainment. Um, some of you may have heard this term, some of you may not know what it means. Essentially what it means is the academic grades or marks that students get and that there appears to be a gap between white students um, in the UK and BAME students. And in fact, if you look in Canada, if you look in the States, if you look in Australia, you see exactly the same picture. Um, the UK is not alone um, in this. The Open University um, some years ago did a survey and a study of this. And it found that this is happening at all levels of education in all subjects. We're not just talking about medicine. And it's been going on for quite a number of years now, at least 16, probably a lot longer than that. Um, it tried to look at why this was happening. Um, and the Oxford, uh, sorry, the, the Open University thought that this was perhaps a little bit due to differences in academic ability. But actually, there seemed to be a lot of other reasons that were far more important that had nothing to do with academic ability. And in fact, if we look in medical training, both for undergraduate, for medical students, as well as postgraduate training for um, doctors in training, we see the same picture. So in the UK, we find that white UK graduates do the best. BAME UK graduates do significantly less well and BAME international graduates, so people who got their primary, their first medical qualification abroad, do the worst of all, so much so that there is a huge gap between white UK graduates and international doctors. Next slide, please. So going back to the Open University um, report and the study, um, they had a look at various uh, possible reasons why this was happening. And they thought, they found this was not attributable to variations in ratings of the course as to what the course was like. So that didn't seem to be a factor. Um, it wasn't a factor that there were variations in academic engagement with one type of student being more engaged than others. That didn't seem to be the case. There were no variations in approaches to studying. And there were no variations in the students' conceptions of learning. This was all work done using self-reported questionnaires to the students. Next slide, please. And the um, Open University study concluded that ethnicity itself was almost certainly not the variable that was influencing students' academic attainment, but it was a proxy for other factors that, um, as it put, have yet to be identified. It's a real big problem. Next slide, please. So we then move on to looking at medicine and attainment in medicine. And um, I'm going to just tell you uh, briefly about a systematic review and meta-analysis of 23 reports that was reported in the BMJ uh, a couple of years ago. Um, looking at medical education and um, academic successes. And again, it found what the Open University had found, that non-white ethnicities performed less well than white candidates, both in undergraduate medicine and in postgraduate medicine. Um, and it didn't really seem to matter what type of test they took. It was um, even if the exam papers were anonymized, so you couldn't tell who they were, um, it certainly was in practical clinical assessments, clinical skills tests and so on, OSCEs and so on. Assessments where there was just pass fail, that uh, still happened. And assessments with continuous outcomes. So it didn't really matter how you assessed them, that differential attainment was still there. And they concluded that ethnic differences were pretty widespread and that they persisted for many years. It lasted right from your undergraduate years into your postgraduate training and they weren't local or atypical problems. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the paper, in case you're interested, uh, by um, Kath Wolf and um, Henry Potts and Chris McManus. Uh, so 742 UK medical students were studied um, as undergraduates and 
about 10,500 graduates as well were looked at. So it's a pretty uh, chunky piece of work, uh, that meta-analysis. OK, next slide, please. So why is this all happening? We don't really know. There are various speculations. It may be due to um, the quality of training that's offered. It may be affected by the standard of entry exams to medical practice. So maybe that people coming in for postgraduate training from abroad start at a lower level. But I don't think that's truly the case, to be honest. Um, it may be that there are family or social influences that are affecting attainment. And it may have its roots for UK graduates in school and the type of school experience that people have had. Or it may be affected by the exams themselves. But there's been a big um, case that went to a judicial review for the Royal College of GPs a few years ago that appears to show that, in fact, it doesn't seem to be the structure of the exams, but really more a factor to do with the training and the way in which we train our medical students and our junior doctors. Next slide, please. So let me move now to Swansea, uh, where I'm the head of graduate entry medicine. Um, let me tell you just briefly about our programme. We only take graduate entry students to read medicine. We don't take students directly from school, so they're that little bit older. We offer 100 places in each year, and we have a four-year programme. Um, other schools in the UK have a five-year programme. About 15% of our students are non-white, or BAME, um, and they come from a range of backgrounds. And students spend most of the first two years on campus, and then most of the last two years off campus in the NHS, learning clinical medicine directly. So in the summer of 2020, last year, there were two main developments for us. First of all, with the murder of George Floyd in um, Minneapolis and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, I received as head of GEM a group email from well over 100 medical students. And round about the same time, we were also trying to get a fairness survey off the ground, but it was taking us a bit of a long time because the university and the main medical school were pretty unhappy about us doing this. But we wanted to find out from our students what their lived experiences were. But we were facing a fair bit of opposition to actually be allowed to do it. Uh, next slide, please. So just to remind everybody about uh, what happened, not that you need any reminding. Uh, George Floyd was killed in May 2020 by a white police officer in Minneapolis. It triggered many protests in many countries across the world, including the UK. And uh, many people marched uh, as part of, of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which is a decentralized global movement which campaigns for freedom, justice and equality. Many universities were involved as their students' unions picked up the cause, and that included our university um, at Swansea. Has anything changed a year later, generally speaking? I'll talk about what's happened in Swansea in a minute. Uh, well, I think we have a more vocal and engaged online public. Authorities are much more mindful of the need to demonstrate ED and I in their interview panels and committees. What was the effect on Swansea University Medical School then? Next slide, please. So on the left hand side of this slide, um, I, I'm telling you what happened and on the right hand side, how we responded. So on the left hand side, about three weeks after the murder of George Floyd, I think emotions were still riding very high. And in June 2020, I received this very large email following a pediatric lecture on child safeguarding. And at the end of that lecture, which apparently was a very good lecture on child safeguarding, a student raised a hand and said, excuse me, but why is it that all the pictures that you've shown us in this lecture are of white children? Where are the other children? And the response from the pediatrician was, I suppose, taken by surprise, but anyway, less than adequate. And essentially what that um, lecturer said was there isn't much evidence uh, about bruising um, on non-white skins and therefore I haven't shown any pictures. 
and the students found that really offensive. And in the email that they sent me, they had two main issues. It was actually a very long email. Um, but the first one was that they felt that the curriculum and what they were learning was based on white mainstream medicine with very little acknowledgement of the multicultural population that is now the UK. And they said, and I agreed with them, that they didn't feel it prepared them for working in the real world. They said that the curriculum content was all about white population health. All the illustrations were of white skinned people. The clinical skills teaching used white skinned models and white role players. And the clinical exams used white role players. And they were right, it did. In addition to that, they were really fed up with con the continual microaggressions that they were experiencing. And actually, some of the things they've told me about are fairly major microaggressions, I would say. But it's the little things. It's people who are well-intentioned and ask you very kindly, where do you come from? And if you say, I come from Birmingham, they'll say, ah, oh, but where do you really come from? And you spend the rest of the, rest of the session seething because you really do come from Birmingham. And although you may have a non-white skin and other uh, cultural heritage, it just makes you feel different and alien to the rest of the group. And then you're not listening and you're not able to concentrate on what you're being taught. The really good thing about this email was that it was extremely well written by the students. Um, and they offered to help us um, to, as they put it, to decolonize the curriculum. And that's a word that many people have been using um, and many places are now trying to decolonize their structures. So how did we respond? Apart from the big sharp intake of breath when you receive an email like that, um, I read it several times and then said to myself, this is a really well-written email. I happen to agree with everything they say. They're offering to help, let's do it. So this is what we've done so far. The first thing we did was to create a mission statement for our program that proclaims what we are and where we stand and what we wish our students to become. And I'll show you that in a minute. It took a long time to write, actually, even though it's very short, just to get it absolutely right. We've engaged the students in a comprehensive curriculum review process where we go through every lecture, every week of learning, and we check um, what is being taught and how it's being taught. Um, we've engaged our academic staff and our clinical NHS colleagues uh, because I wrote them a letter, a long letter, explaining what had happened and explaining what we were planning to do and asking them to include more um, examples of diversity in their teaching and to think carefully about how they might inadvertently be causing offence to our students. I sent that letter out in June it went to hundreds of people across Southwest Wales. I must say, I did feel it was a bit like poking a stick into an ant's or hornet's nest, uh, but actually I only got one uh, very negative response. And by far the most responses I received were very positive. We also then instituted active bystander training sessions. By active bystander, what we mean, and this is a very well used term, so forgive me if I'm um, preaching to the converted here. Many of us have been in situations where some act of aggression, racial abuse, micro or macro has happened, and nobody says anything. And that's usually because they don't know what to do. They don't know how to respond to it. They don't know what to say. There are hierarchies of power there. And so as a student, you may not wish to confront a consultant and so on. Active bystander training helps you learn how to respond when these things happen so that you can support the victim um, and you can help them deal with it um, instead of the victim having to deal with it themselves. We've also made it a lot easier for students to log a complaint or a concern, although we've still got a way to go. It's not still not as good as I would like. And uh, the British Medical Association uh, Students um, Committee have um, written a racial harassment charter that they approached us with last year. We've signed that charter alongside Cardiff University Medical School. So as an all Wales movement, we've planted our flag uh, very firmly in the anti-racist camp. Can I have the next slide, please? 
So this is our mission statement. And we are aiming to produce excellent, caring and inclusive clinicians for a global society. By excellent, of course, I mean a doctor who knows what they're doing, keeps up to date um, and uh, does their work well. For caring, of course, I mean a doctor who cares about his or her patients, their families, the communities in which they're working. And inclusive, I mean a doctor who understands um, about um, allowing patients to be in a situation of cultural safety um, and knows when to ask questions uh, in order to make sure that happens. Uh, and of course, for a global society, well, if we haven't learned how important it is to be a global society from COVID, then we're never going to learn, are we? So we brought that in um, as well. Next slide, please. So coming back to that fairness survey that I told you about where we were having a bit of trouble getting it off the ground. In 2019, the General Medical Council had asked all medical schools to give a report of any equality issues that had been logged. And rather surprisingly, we had none logged. That didn't mean to say they weren't happening. They were happening. We were clearly either not receiving them or not recording them, neither of which is good. We didn't keep a register of our students' protected characteristics, nor of our clinical examiners, or even of our teachers. So we really had no data at all on equality and diversity. And we didn't produce any analysis of how students were performing academically by their protected characteristics. So the fairness survey was an anonymized survey to send to all our students. It was a first step. The university didn't like it. They didn't like the word fairness. They thought that we would dig up additional issues that might be difficult to manage reputationally. They objected to it being called a fairness survey and it took eight months in the end to get permission to send it out. Well, we did then, uh, helped by the fact that the GMC knew that we had this survey and every time they visited us, they asked us how it was getting along. So eventually the university had to let us do it. So we sent it to all our students and about a third of them responded. We asked for any events of discrimination they had experienced that they thought were unfair by, by protected characteristics. So there are nine protected characteristics of which ethnicity is just one. And what was interesting was that we had quite a number of reports, but we had equal reports of racism and sexism. One report of religious discrimination, which was to do with headscarf, and one report of homophobic comments and no reports of any of the other protected characteristics. And we're aiming to send this survey out now annually so that we can keep a track of what's going on. Because it's anonymized, we're very hopeful that the students will respond. Um, next slide, please. So one year later, what has changed? And of course, there's a yes and a no. So on the yes side, I can say that we now respond fast and decisively to reports of discrimination and the students know that we're listening and they've told us that and they're very pleased uh, with that change. We're making good progress on decolonizing the curriculum and we're bringing the whole team with us and that has been quite a job because not everybody wishes to change of course. We've invested in new clinical models uh, with different skin tone colors. We've required our role player agency and even that was a bit of a struggle to supply us with role players that represent the British population as a whole. We've sourced some excellent active bystander training and have run courses for our students, as well as our staff, as well as our NHS colleagues. And we've worked with our local hospital trusts in Southwest Wales to raise awareness of ED&I and get them to offer training as well. And of course, continuing with our fairness survey. But it's a long job and it's nowhere near uh, where it should be. We still get reports of microaggression incidents from staff, patients, and other students. I've been badgering our hospital trusts to devise and adopt a code of conduct for patients, as well as for staff, because some of the worst acts of abuse coming from, are coming from patients. Uh, we haven't really succeeded in getting our hospital trust to deliver active bystander training themselves. They're very happy to come to our sessions and speak highly of them but they haven't actually done it themselves and so that's an ongoing piece of work and we haven't succeeded in getting our concerns process even simpler by putting it on our website again because university gets concerned 
that that will just dig up a whole load more concerns that perhaps would be better left unconcerned. But I'm very keen to do that and we are moving on with that. Uh, next slide. What do we still need to do? Well, there's the ongoing vigilance, um, ongoing development, building on what we've done so far. I'd like to see some annual audit and quality reports um, on diversity in place for our admissions processes, our assessment and our health and conduct that looks at race equality and keeps checking that we're being fair to our, all our students. And of course, there's a role for ongoing role modeling as well. Um, when we held our Zoom team calls, just looking at the screen, we suddenly realized we've got real diversity in our GEM senior academic team that we make nothing of. So we are a diverse group of academics and we are making this explicit to the students. Uh, and of course, we are um, continuing our curriculum development, bringing other aspects of diversity and inequality uh, to the table um, as well. I think I must be coming to the end of my slides. I think there may be just one more left. Thank you. I'm going to leave you with this because I found it when I was uh, doing the research to uh, write this presentation and I thought it looked good. It's a model which uh, shows you how um, HEI, which is higher education institutions, can combat racism. And it's a four step model, really. The first being to define and understand racism and then to defend and empower people who are victims of abuse. And the third is to develop institutional accountability, which is what I'm working on at the moment. And then the fourth, of course, is to review what we're doing and build on it. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there, which will leave us a few minutes for discussion and questions. Wonderful. Thanks very much, um, Professor Hawthorne. Um, I can see that we do have a question in the Q&A. Um, ah, Alison's there, so I will leave her to uh, lead the Q&A discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you, Alison. But um, yeah, we can we can hear you fine. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla, very much. That was uh, an extremely um, clear and informative presentation on uh, uh, such an essential, important topic. And it's something that we all need to be aware of. And we need to do more, I think, all of us to address the problem. It was quite sobering to be reminded right at the very beginning of local examples of racism and um, then how um, discrimination was almost sort of institutionalized into the medical curriculum, um, which then you um, responded to so well. Um, and I found it um, useful as well to be reminded of active bystander training. Um, if anybody has any questions for Camilla, would you like to put them into the question and answer? section please um we have a couple yeah we have a couple in there already um let me uh, put this up onto the stage so uh, catherine says in 2020 there were more international medical graduates newly registered with the gmc than uk and eu medical graduates combined how can we make their early experiences better in light of the evidence that you describe here so i think this is um a really good question um, I know that in Wales, um, HEIW, who are the organisation in Wales that organise um, the training of postgraduate um, healthcare uh, staff, uh, so that's Health Education and Innovation Wales, HEIW, are doing some very good work on, uh, first of all, um, giving anybody who's new to the country an induction. Um, for us in Wales, it would be not just an induction, introduction to the NHS, but also to the culture and values um, of Wales and why we are proud to be here um, in Wales and why we enjoy being Welsh. Um, but it's also about how to get a bank account, how to buy a car, 
how to buy a house, uh, where to look for schools, all of those things that you need when you're newly arrived in a country that is completely strange to you. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, is the need for mentorship uh, so that people feel protected, they feel valued, they feel wanted, they really are wanted. I mean, we're desperate to have these people here because we wouldn't be able to manage without them, as you say. Um, I think it's, it is almost half, if not more than half, of all medical uh, doctors registered with the GMC are actually internationally qualified and didn't qualify in the UK. And we ought to be doing a lot more to make them feel welcomed and valued than we currently do. Mm. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, there are some good examples of HEIs responding to decolonised curriculums, but I see little action coming from those operating in the global health space. Are you able to comment? So um, I think it is actually happening, but it all depends on where. So it's patchy because, of course, it depends on the HEI themselves. And a lot of this, I think, has to come from the top. So a lot depends on the leaders. I mean, this is what that vice chancellor was saying um, that I was telling you about Universities UK. That report says that it's actually the vice chancellors who need the education more than anybody uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with racism. And quite honestly, one of the things that our fairness survey has um, picked up is that there's almost an equal amount of sexism going on as well. So, you know, what sort of situation are the people who um, who have both a race and a sex sex issue, if you like, you know, what about all the non-white female um, healthcare professionals that we have? Uh, what about all those who perhaps um, are gay uh, or lesbian? What about all the ones who, you know, that, so we, we really have got a long way to go still. Mm -hmm. I agree it isn't happening as fast as it could. And for anything, I think things are slowing down slightly um, although the BLM movement helped um, things along really very well. And for me, although I very much deplore what happened um, in Minneapolis, um, I suppose the silver lining for me was that I was able to use it to uh, further um, a development of our medical school in the direction where I wanted it to go. Mm. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is, do you think the main problem is denial or deliberate unwillingness or even inherent racist attitudes? I think it's um, certainly denial. Um, I think a lot of people who haven't been discriminated against or maybe haven't noticed that they've been discriminated against um, deny that it's happening. Um, um, I think deliberate unwillingness, there is a, an element of that. Um, but I, because people don't like change uh, and in order to make change you have to make yourself challenged and when you're challenged you feel uncomfortable and as for deliberate racism that's really difficult to um, identify a, a, a sort of overt uh, racism but I think that the structures are inherently racist mm. uh, you know they are structurally um, institutionally racist just in the way things are organized so if you go to an interview for example for a senior ranking position, the people on the interview panel are likely to be um, white. They're very likely to be predominantly male. They're very likely to be older. Um, and they will um, naturally pick people who are like themselves, or people who are going to become like themselves. It's a kind of natural human tendency. And you, you need the training to be able to see that diversity actually enriches uh, what you can offer. Um, and opens doors to places that perhaps you wouldn't have gone to if you stayed same old, same old. Um, but, you know, that really does take time. Um, my, my husband is, um, is English and um, grew up in, in the UK and um, is part of the establishment, I suppose. Um, and I often say to him, if we both went for an interview, as soon as he walked into the room, people would immediately know what he was, what he stood for, what kind of person he was, just by looking at him within a few seconds. And that's, again, partly because they come from the same tribe. Whereas for me, if I walk in, they don't know that. And it takes me a few minutes to be able to get to the same sort of position, assuming I can do so. I can't always do that because people won't always listen. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I'm, as you can see, I'm a very westernized lady. So, um, you know, for people who are even more um, alien, it's even more difficult. 
Thank you. OK, um, so the next question we have is um, you said you that you received only a small amount of negative feedback on your email. How did you tackle it? Were you able to change views or did you have to accept that some people are entrenched in their views and experience white fragility? OK, uh, well, if you want to know the story, what happened was I received an email that was very short. It said, Dear Professor Hawthorne, I've read your email. Thank you for your email. Having read it, I've decided I no longer want your students on my ward rounds or to take part in your assessments. Wow. Kind regards. That's what it oh said. And I read it and I thought, oh, my goodness, exactly. Um, what, what do you, of course, I was angry as well. Um, but um, I slept on it because it's never a good idea to return an email straight away when you're cross. Um, and in the end, I wrote back to this person and said, do you think we could have a conversation about this? Because I thought, where does this all come from? So in the end, I did. This was a, a secondary care consultant, uh, male, white, of course, um, who seemed very nice when I first spoke on Zoom. In fact, stayed very nice all the way through the conversation we had, which was a long one. And it turned out in the end that what had angered him was my email in which I'd explained that I'd received an email from which had been signed by well over 100 medical students. And this man looked at that email and thought to himself, this isn't really racism, not really. So he looked at this email and he thought to himself, how dare they, these students, they're just getting too big for their boots, aren't they? I don't want anything more to do with them. And as a result, then fired off this email to me. So yeah. Perhaps he was an idiot. Um, certainly that's part of it. But um, it was just very interesting that that was what irritated him, was the fact that the students had clubbed together and had sent me this massive email, massly signed email. Um, and I then responded, I, you know, I, yes, I, I, I was a bit surprised when I got it. as uh, first time I've had anything like that. Um, but, you know, at least I had the grace to read it several times and then think to myself, actually, they've written it rather well and they're offering to help. And I put all of that into my email uh, that I sent out to all my colleagues. Um, but that was his response was, how dare they? Incredible. Um, okay, I think we've probably got time for a couple more. Um, so uh, a question from Catherine, has this felt personal for you regarding sexism and racism and has your experience changed over time? Well, um, Yes, of course it does, for obvious reasons. Um, it brings back things that have happened to me during my career that at the time you just get on with your life. You know, things have happened that have been sexist, things have happened that have been racist, and sometimes, I don't know, maybe they've been both. Um, but um, you get on with it. You know, at the time, um, there wasn't anybody to complain to. I didn't make any complaints. I never have. Maybe I should have done. I feel very proud of these students that they're standing up and saying, come on now, this is, this is not acceptable. Mm. And I agree, with it. I agree with them. It's not acceptable. It's not what I would want for my children. Um, and it's not what I would want for anybody else's children, to be honest. Mm. Uh, and so yeah, I'm very happy to support them. I think I'm very um, fortunate in some ways to be in the job I'm, I've got to. So all that sexism and racism perhaps didn't hold me back as much as it could have done. Um, and I'm really enjoying it, but it also gives me an opportunity to be a role model mm -hmm. um, and to show um, students that it is possible to actually deal with things like this without anger and without bitterness and that you move on, you know, that you, you, you tell people what's wrong um, and that what you want are done to put it right. And I'm doing that all the time, um, but you don't allow it to make you bitter and twisted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. And sort of linked to that, the next question is, did your surveys from the students enable students to comment on their line manager's attitudes? So, you know, giving, like you say, giving them that forum to be able to um, to explain what's going on and how they feel. Uh, yes, I mean, it does. So we do quite often get, um, I quite often get emails from students, individual students saying, can I have a chat with you? And that usually means they want to tell me about something. Um, and, and actually, what's also interesting, which I think is really good, is the active bystander training seems to be having some dividends now, because um, not long ago, a white female medical student emailed me to tell me that she thought her African um, female colleague was not getting the same treatment that she was getting. 
um, which I was and, and didn't want to report it because she didn't want to appear to be a troublemaker. Um, I was very grateful that that, that um, the the white medical student had done that um, and and praised her for having done so because obviously we, we looked into it and we're we're trying to trying to sort out things like that. So they are commenting. Um, I don't know what you mean by line managers. I suppose you mean their tutors and teachers. Yes, they do. They come and tell me about um, homophobic. I mean, it's still going on, of course. It doesn't actually seem to get that much better. Uh, but we're responding in a much more robust way now. Fantastic. Thank you. Alison, over to you to introduce the next bit of the session. Well, thank you again, Camilla, for, for that. You've definitely given us a lot to think about um, so thank you very much and um, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Kathy Lugo who's um, you've seen over the last two days um, supporting the conference and also um, Faith Israel um, and they're going to talk to you about um, the Hub Khomri Africa's anti-racist charter which is in development um, Kat is Development Support Manager at um, HCA and Faith is a Diaspora and Inclusion Officer and she's only been in post for four weeks so thank you Faith for, for speaking to us this afternoon. Over to you both, thank you. Hi, thank you very much for that and thank you Camilla for your um, presentation, it was really interesting, I really enjoyed listening to what you've been doing so thank you. Um, so really quickly, we're just going to talk to you for 10 minutes before the end of the session. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, again, you can still put them in the Q&A or put them in the chat. Um, so, uh, but I'll just quickly run through what we've been doing. Um, so um, as a lot of you will know, um, SSAP, which is the Sub-Saharan Africa uh, Sub-Saharan Advisory Panel, sorry, um, is uh, founded on principles of, of promoting anti-racism in the sector and Hub Cymru Africa um, are working to support uh, and promote best practice in the Wales Africa community. Um, and so a couple of years ago, we came together, um, well, we worked together anyway, but we've collaborated on um, a new project, which is called Reframing the Narrative. Um, and the aim of this project initially was to bring to light some of our unconscious biases and assumptions. Um, and that often comes out in our comms and in our storytelling around our work. Um, and we would particularly focus on imagery. Um, Following the, the murder of George, George Floyd, um, similar to how Camilla was explaining, um, this resulted in the popularity of the Black Lives Matter movement and it encouraged a lot of people to reflect on racism in our everyday lives and in our work. Um, and within the development sector, that was certainly a reckoning. Um, this reflection kind of made people uh, review their approach and um, through the reframing the narrative, project a lot of people were coming to us wanting to do things differently and maybe not always knowing how to do things differently um you know we're all in this for the right reasons we're all really passionate about not doing harm um and so some of the people were asking us for support in how to avoid unintentional unintentional harm um and ask for advice in doing things differently um so we move forward with the Reframing the Narrative project with taking a more practical approach to helping people talk through um, uh, some of the challenges and some of the barriers and thinking how uh, they can approach their work. Um, and through this, uh, we've decided to, uh, with Claire O'Shea, our head of partnership, um, to develop an anti-racism charter. And this is where the charter comes in. Um, we're hoping that um, we will provide this charter will provide a tool for the Wales Africa community um, that will help um, organizations and groups and links to think about um, principles of anti-racism in their work and in, and embed them into their work. Um, so the first step is a consultation. We've written up a draft charter, which we'll share with you in a minute. Um, but we're at the very early stages of um, trying to consult with the Wales Africa community and the Wales Africa Health Links Network community to understand how this tool can be best used to be purposeful for you. 
Um, so I'm going to introduce Faith to you now, and uh, Faith is going to tell you a little bit about the chapter. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Claire, um, and thank you, Camilla. Uh, that was such an interesting talk. Um, but yeah, so the aim of the charter essentially is to help uh, charities, community groups that are based in Wales in realising some of those anti-racist ambitions within their work in global solidarity. And so what we've done is essentially look at the ways in which that we can incorporate uh, anti-racist policies, anti-racist behaviours and actions as well um, into the work within the Welsh development space. And so the Charter will also be accompanied by a toolkit and this will essentially further break down each point in the Charter into more actionable steps. Um, and so essentially we are aiming to see a tangible change in the ways in which we work. And like Kath said already, we really want to talk to as many groups as possible in order to ensure we get a wide range of feedback and make sure that the charter is as effective as possible in assisting charities uh, in being anti-racist um, in their work. And so just a quick overview of the charter itself. Um, it essentially starts by acknowledging the fact that racism does exist in the development sector as it exists in wider society. And so we need to acknowledge this and acknowledge how it manifests. And from this, uh, I guess, just take action, um, honest action to ensure that we can work uh, against those negative impacts uh, that racism has. And so essentially, the charter encompasses declarations to ensure that no single individual, no single group is left to tackle racism on their own. But actions are taken by everyone uh, to dismantle racist structures and systems. And so in doing this, we want to ensure that in-country expertise is acknowledged, it's valued and it's prioritised, um, especially like but from partners in African context, we want to ensure that they are included in trainings, in events, and especially in decision-making, as this will ensure that our teams and our partnerships aren't just diverse, but they are also equitable and ensure that there is an accountability mechanism, not just to the funders, but also to the very communities that we are working with. Um, and so essentially, we want to make sure that the, the work we're doing and the partnerships we are creating um, are sustainable in every sense of the word, from a social aspect to a human aspect to an economic and especially to an environmental aspect. As we know, the people that are leading the least carbon heavy lives uh, are the ones that will likely feel the greatest impacts of climate change. And so we want to ensure that the work we are doing in the long run will be beneficial um, to all these communities that we are working with. And then finally, uh, we essentially say in the Charter that we will adopt more thoughtful, more appropriate language, storytelling and images when doing our work, because these things have meaning. And if used improperly, they can cause harm. And so we want to be aware of this and ensure that in the work we do, we are being thoughtful and more careful in, in the words we choose and the language that we use. And so essentially going forward, uh, we are actually going to be going into a breakout session uh, immediately after this. So uh, for those of you that want to hear a bit more, please join us. Kath will tell you a bit more about that. Um, and that will be immediately after this. And more generally for everybody listening, um, there will also be a focus group happening. Um, and this will be specifically with uh, those groups that are working within the health space, as we want to ensure that we are able to create a toolkit that is specific to the health sector and make sure that the charter itself is useful and applicable to the work that uh, we are all doing. Um, so I'm just gonna hand over to Kath to tell you more about the session. Thanks, Faith. Appreciate it. Um, so before we go any further, I'm just going to publish a poll. So the poll should pop up on your right hand side. And oh, it's 
popping up right in the middle here. And it, so the question is, would you like to be involved with um, future discussions developing an anti-racist charter for all? So um, if you click yes on this, what, me what it means is that we'll be able to access your contact details and we'll be able to get in touch with you. We're not going to get in touch with you about anything willy-nilly. We're just going to contact you to invite you to either a focus group or to... Um, uh, to fill in an on online feedback form based on your um, views of the charter. Um, so that will be all we'll use your information for. But if you're happy for us to get in touch with you, please do have a click on the, um, uh, please do have a click on the, the poll. That would be great. Um, so now I want to explain what's going to happen afterwards. Um, this session is finishing in four minutes. Uh, and so we're going to need some time to, for Alison to wrap up. Uh, but we assume that you might have some questions or might want to discuss the charter. So when you when the session finishes, you'll automatically be in the networking room. Um, and you know the little tables, you've got a square table with um, images of chairs around it. There's one called anti-racism. So if you click on join for that group, uh, you'll be able to join a group and then it'll be more like Zoom. We'll all be able to see each other and ask, each other things directly um, and so we'll just be there for half an hour um, to, to have a chat about this so feel free to um, join that uh, and, and, and talk to us. Um, I've also put our email address in the chat so please get in touch that way if you don't have time to meet with us now or if you um, are not sure about doing the poll and what that means. Um, I'm going to put a copy of the charter into the chat as well um, for you to see. We didn't want to give it to you straight away because you know what it's like. If you start reading and not listening. So I'm going to stick it into you now. Um, but do take it. Do um, click on the link if you're interested. Uh, do click on the link and do have a look at it. Um, once this session finishes, you might lose the link. You might not be able to access the chat again. So make sure if you are interested in it, have a look at it now um, so that you can look at it later when you need to. I think that's it, Faith. Did I miss anything? No? Okay. Excellent. All right, lovely. Um, we are going to hand over back to Alison. Thank you very much for having us. Oh, Alison, we appear to have lost your sound again, which is unfortunate. We can see you're talking. Um, maybe if you want to uh, pop out of the session and pop back in again whilst I launch the polls, and then hopefully we'll have you for the wrap up at the end. Um, apologies for that, everybody. Um, I'm just going to, if you're not all polled out, launch a few polls to um, get your um, feedback on today's session and the conference more widely. Um, if you don't mind taking a few minutes just to complete that, it really helps us uh, when planning these events and, um, like I say, being responsive to the needs of the sector. Um, so I'll just get those up on screen. There's a few of them, so bear with me. Um, but otherwise, thank you to our speakers um, for a fantastic session. Thank you, Professor Camilla. I, I think you're still with us um, uh, for a very interesting um, session. And um, thank you for your insightful questions from the audience. Um, it was great to get your input too. And also to Kath and Faith um, to explaining a bit about the anti-racist charter that HCA are developing. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave those polls open for a couple of minutes to uh, allow people to have time to click on them um, and to remind you all that um, as well as the anti-racist uh, table in the networking section there's also uh, another table that you can join if you just want to network more generally and um, there's also a, an option to um, not speed date speed network um, which it will pair you with somebody um, and you can chat to them about what you're doing and hear about what they're doing. Um, the next session at four o'clock is um, showcasing some of the health links from our sector, talking about um, the project work that they've done during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and we've got four links presenting their work then. So hopefully we will see some of you there. Um, but yes, apart from that, thank you, Professor Camilla, and thank you, Alison, uh, for being part of today's session. And um, hopefully we will see you all again soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.